Hello, this is Kelsey from The Score Esports, and I am here to do another video discussion. Right now, I'm going to tell you that this video is going to have a lot of information and a lot of stuff in it. Um, it's about why I believe or why I think some of the contributing factors have led to the LPL region no longer being the second best region, and really why I think that there is no longer really a second best region in League of Legends. You have Korea, probably like the three tier two regions, NAEU and LPL, and then LMS can oscillate occasionally, wildcard, etc., etc. Originally, I was going to make an argument as to why I think you can look at these teams that went to Worlds and the regions as they are and say that they're really close. But since there's so much material already in this video, I decided to kind of just make this an assumption. I think that even if you aren't buying into that assumption and you still kind of believe that LPL is the second best region, you can see that some of their results haven't been as convincing, maybe. And by that I mean, in the 2013-2014 era, we had maybe not LPL being definitively the second best region, but you had OMG as like the best non-Korean team. I would make that argument. A lot of people would say Royal and look at Royal and Royal's results placing top two, but something that OMG and the Royal rivalry was really interesting regarding was that over time, Royal would get really good at identifying flaws and stylistic issues that the enemy team had. And then OMG, I think, was just playing their style and doing well with it, researching kind of the Korean scene. They had some of the most impressive results of any non-Korean team against Korean teams at Worlds. They were one of the only teams to take a game off SKT in 2013, and they're still, I think, the only non-Korean team to beat a... Korean team in a best of five in the history of world championships. So that kind of, to me, made LPL maybe look like the second best region, or at least have the second, the best non-Korean team. But we aren't really seeing one of those teams. We haven't really had a WE, we haven't really had a 2015 MSI EDG, a 2013-2014 OMG come out, come out, and there's in the past two world championships and even at MSI, because I think there is still some debate about Royal versus CLG, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that that needs to be discussed and why I think some of these factors are contributing to that. I thought right now is a really good time since we recently had that Reddit thread pop up called a Chinese player's rants on LPL and all-star votes and why he no longer plays League of Legends in China. A lot of this stuff I think is really angry kind of at rants, like very obviously impassioned. Some things are exaggerated, but a lot of these topics are things that have been discussed a lot in the Chinese community and that have gone over. And I think there's some credence to them. For me, the biggest thing for the LPL right now and the Chinese scene as a whole is a change in priority. Over the past few years, it's become like the the esports market in China has just boomed incredibly well. And a big part of that is the streaming platforms and are the streaming platforms. A lot of the streaming platforms will make deals with Chinese teams to sign specific players, which will create really, really large salary opportunities for specific players, sometimes salary inequality. So if you're maybe the most popular Chinese player or a Korean player, you're going to have a, a very large salary discrepancy, even maybe against some other Chinese players on your team. If you want to talk about difference in changes, even back in 2012, Messiah in a recent reflection video discussed how in WE's first team house, they would give up eating sometimes or give up certain meals to pay for their internet. Now, if you see Messiah, he's advertising all of his products on his Taobao. He's talking about giveaways. If you watch his stream, he's in movies, he's in music videos. He's become a really, really huge sensation in that regard and makes a lot of money. So it's just, he, he kind of encapsulates how large and how much the market has grown. This doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing because I know a lot of people want a lot of money in the industry, but you have this very, very top approach where the celebrities are huge and maybe your day-to-day -day players are, are not. So it creates this 
idea and this need to achieve this top level among the Chinese players. And this has led to kind of the stigma or conception around Chinese players themselves that they really just want to get into the scene to get popular enough or to do well enough to retire and go into streaming. And this is why you have all these ideas that these players are constantly threatening to quit esports and stream. A lot of the reasons why there is this gap or why there are these high demands for specific Korean players or specific popular Chinese players is that there are a lot of competing streaming platforms. I think there are more than I can count on two hands with big ones being things like Huya, Douyu, etc, etc. Trenin has actually been play paying very well for some of the really popular ones like UCI. And there's all sorts of merchandising. Teams will make the flops, mugs, sweaters, shirts, outfits. Like EDG actually just came out with a clothing line designed specifically for their female fans. So on top of some of like the face shirts of the players that they put out, like just ridiculous amount of effort put on this this type of specific merchandising or things like this. There's a lot of specific fan donations and fan gifts in large amounts to the most popular and the favorite players, things like this. It just gets really, really large. And I think it was at the start of this year when EDG commented that they have two hours of obligation for media interaction or marketing specifically just outside of streaming a day. And then on top of that, there's usually like a 40 hour cap per month on the amount of streaming that players can sign or, or do per month. Though one of the my favorite stories that I like to tell to kind of convey, it's, it's just like a small issue about how um, really interesting and how far some of this, this marketing stuff has gone is that there was a like somewhat controversial promotion with Cora One and Steel Series. Steel Series is one of Edward Gaming's sponsors, and they were doing this thing where if you bought a mouse with a code, like a, a number of random fans who bought this mouse would have Cora One hand deliver it to their house. Okay. And then initially there were a lot of Cora One's fangirls who went online and started complaining that the weather was too hot in the middle of summer in Shanghai for Cora One to start delivering mice to people in Shanghai door to door. Cora One made the matter worse by saying, like, I don't really want to do it. But eventually, you know, Steel Series and EDG made him do it anyway. When he did, they live streamed him going from house to house and delivering these mice. And then Clear Love brought up his own stream and started delivering this, this entertaining commentary over the whole thing. So it was actually just like very, very kind of conscientious, very kind of hilarious marketing sort of techniques going on with Clear Love like making fun of Cora One doing this sort of thing and the fans interacting on both streams, things like this going on. So it's it becomes a very, very large part of the player's lifestyle just this constant bombardment and this constant marketing issue. And this is also reflected in the commentary and in the ownership and in the solo queue ladder, right? This, this focus on kind of getting the amount out in this huge boom and, and how much this industry has grown and how much this has gone by. And you see it in some of the casting. The casting is very, very much based on gravitas, based off bravado, based off making jokes, based off decorating these players. There's this very famous phrase that's like, big go away, which is pot carrier, which if you have this conception of like some of these old Chinese men carrying large pots on their back. So these are the ones that bear the burden. They bear the blame. They're kind of like the scapegoats. So cast, you will hear this phrase in Chinese casting quite a lot. If there's a player who performs particularly badly, he'll say, you know, this is like the ultimate bay go away, the, the, the pot carrier, the one who's to blame for this match. And so a lot of this type of focused casting is why specific players often get blamed in China after poor world's performances and things like that. I'm not going to blame all of the casting, but I think it definitely might have an impact on that to an extent. Also, like I mentioned the OMG series where they threw owed Najin before, uh, also very famous. The casters themselves, they got very excited. You know, they went over the top, right? They, they just completely lost it. And these casters are still extremely popular because of like the showmanship and how valuable that was at that time. And as I, as I mentioned, this is this is reflected in the solo queue environment as well. The solo queue environment is actually like when people say that Riot should do something about the solo queue environment in China and the ELO boosting going on. I just 
it's actually insane to me that I, I, I mean, I'm not saying anything about Riot or, or if they want to try to do something about this or anything like this. It's just the how you would even go about doing some, something like this is pretty pretty crazy. Like, there's the famous line where Xiao Xiao was caught for ELO boosting in North America, and he said that I just, I mean, everyone does it in China. It was just nothing. He did, it didn't even occur to him that this could be considered against the rules or that he could get in trouble for that. There are, there's evidence that there are some like ELO boosting houses where players like live together and they ELO boost and they're paid for like similar to gaming houses. There, it, it's really rampant in um, the the Chinese server. And then on top of that, a lot of the top LPL pros choose to play on the Korean server instead of the Chinese server. So this creates like this really weird devaluation of doing well or performing well on the Chinese solo queue ladder. So there's a lot of issues with scouting Chinese talent that comes in. Like a lot of owners don't put in the investment partly because like there's not as much marketing value there's the stigma against these chinese players and just like the general solo queue environment being really really bad so i think a lot of these factors have led to like just poor scouting i think it's actually really still easy to find good chinese talent that can be molded or developed in the chinese solo queue ladder but then you get into the next step which is basically a lack of strong um I'm not going to say the word infrastructure because I feel like this word gets overused a lot, but a lot of strong coaching or support in that regard. There aren't a lot of people around who are going to teach the players again because a lot of the big popular previously successful figures are streaming, had their own marketing de deals. They don't go back into the organizations. In North America or Europe, a lot of times you see successful pros retire, they become coaches, they become management, they stay with the organization in that kind of capacity, and they help like teach players, and the infrastructure grows and builds itself from there. In China, you see much less of this because it's just much more lucrative to make more independent marketing deals, independent sponsorship, things like this, than to stay with the teams themselves and help mentor the players. So when this, this frustrated Chinese player said that people just blame the inf infrastructure, they just blame management. I think there's some truth to that. And it, it stems not just from the marketing itself, but it, it goes way back, right? Because in 2011, Wang Sitsong, Wang Sitsong, excuse me, originally bought uh, Catastrophic Cruel Memory, which was Invictus Gaming. And when he purchased this team, it was this signal for the direction of the way Chinese infrastructure developed. Because Wang Sitsong was the son of Wang Junlin, the richest man in China. So a lot of these other second generation rich started also buying teams because it became the trendy thing, right? And they didn't, it almost became a, a competition in a way. It's like, how much money can I spend on this and all those other things. And then the, the owners started becoming friends with the players, maybe overriding some of the decisions in an, in an unproductive way, saying, no, he has to play solo queue with me now. He can't play in this practice. Not necessarily supporting coaching staff decision to some extent. I'm not just going to blame the streaming market. I think that a lot of the infrastructure structural issues stem from back then. But it previously, like a lot of the infrastructure was more advanced. Like they had gaming houses, they had coaches, they had staff, like all the way back in 2011, 2012, when the West did not. So that's something to also consider. It's just that from there, it hasn't developed in part because I think there was a signal from way back to make all the scene about marketing, about money. And it just continued to progress from there with the addition of, and the influence of streaming platforms. And really, it's an issue of management and management not necessarily supporting moves to get competent coaches and things like this. And people will bring up this idea that, well, what about the Korean coaches that came to China and tried to support the teams in this way and tried to teach the Chinese players? Well, a lot of this was also either marketing based or when the Korean players came, they didn't have the management to enforce their decision or the Korean coaches came, they didn't have the management to enforce their decisions. Frustrated because of the language and cultural barrier, there was the very famous OMG case in 2015 where the OMG players said that they expected 
the coach to kind of earn their respect and the coach expected them to listen. And also OMG were a very confrontational team and a very close team and also a very player run team. So when something went wrong, they would immediately start like yelling at each other and arguing about things that went wrong after the match. The coach did this thing where he isolated the players, he kept them from addressing these issues together, and so problems that they had just kind of festered because the coach didn't understand that, you know, this is our normal process. We get through it like this and um, just divided them. I don't know if this was a cultural thing, it was just like difficulty communicating or something like this, but there are a lot of issues that arise because these Korean coaches aren't used to the Chinese players and vice versa. Now, the last topic is, why am I blaming infrastructure when you have a team like Tigers with very minimal infrastructure? They just have a coach, right? Has gone very far, has gone to a world championship final, has gone five games against SKT at the recent world championship, has defeated Edward Gaming pretty soundly, has won an LCK, etc., etc. And people have, from the scene, have come out and said, you can't blame infrastructure when this is happening. Well, the reality is that different cultures and different players are going to demand different things. Different systems require different reinforcement. In Korea, I think if you have a player like Dardock or Forgiven or whatever, to an extent, they'll just be cast aside because you can replace them. But in the West or in China, if you have a player like that, there's a really good reason to, to work with that player, to, to kind of find ways to work with him. And so you need more resources to do that. And I'm not talking about more people necessarily, but a different type of approach or stronger management or things like this. You need people who know what they're doing. In, in Korea, there are probably just more coaches in general who know what they're doing because of the history of the game. You are, we're still building those types of coaches here. We don't necessarily have them yet. So these like very basic things are, are still infrastructural issues that you need to build. Infrastructural needs because of cultural and solo queue reasons and where these players are coming from. Like there's very different solo queue culture in China, in Europe, in North America, in Korea that give these players different foundations when they're learning about the game. So you need different types of resources sometimes. Just like assuming that you can just copy the Korea what the Koreans are doing, then you'll have the same result, like regardless. And and even in Korea one size doesn't fit all. Like maybe if Nofe went to a different team that wasn't the Tigers, it would be a complete disaster because they would need more guidance. They would need more infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just like this very, very rare specific case that's not even I mean necessarily relevant. So I think that basically covers my full rundown of what I think are some of the reasons why Chinese results have been not as strong as they were in 2013 and 2014. To reiterate, I think there is a big shift to marketing. I want to emphasize that I don't think this necessarily has to be a bad thing, right? Marketing can be a huge successful thing. And if, if I've talked to managers like Hunter, like Zou, and they were both very proud of how, how large the esports market is in China and how much it's grown and how lucrative it well, not necessarily lucrative, but just how much money can be made to an extent, at least by the players right now. I don't think you necessarily look at what the Chinese scene is doing and say this is terrible, right? It just means that the results have taken a backseat, have become a different priority. And so when you talk about like all the, this huge Chinese esports marketing machine that's emerged, you can be both judgmental and self-reflective. Thank you for watching. You can find more of our videos on thescoreesports.com, the app, and the YouTube channel.